Welcome to the Waiting Room Revolution. On this episode, we talk with Dr. Roz Jurgens, a medical oncologist who treats lung cancer. She is the head of the Department of Clinical Trials at the Jurvinsky Cancer Center in Hamilton, among many other roles. We talk about zooming out with a lung cancer diagnosis and get insight into how she communicates with her patients to provide great care along the whole journey. Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Roz, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Sian, for inviting me. Really excited to get to be here. Also have Dr. Aaron Gallagher from Season 2, who's a family doctor and palliative care specialist joining us. Aaron, welcome. Thank you very much. So for our listeners, maybe, Roz, you can start with talking about the kind of patients that you treat in the cancer center? Sure. So I'm a medical oncologist. I practice in Hamilton, Ontario, um, and my areas of expertise are treating patients who have cancers of their their lungs um, and then cancers of sort of their uh, food pipe. So their esophagus and then the stomach. So Roz, we're trying to figure out what a typical cancer journey would look like. And I know you specialize in lung and as you said, uh, the esophagus, but if you had to describe what a typical cancer journey is like, how would you describe that? Even though we know there's so many different types of cancer, this is really big picture. You know, on, on one side, I am thrilled to sit here and tell you that we have come so far when it comes to personalizing the treatment for cancer patients, which is spectacular. The, the fact that I don't have a one size fits all for each person who walks in my door. Now, if I don't have the right information at my fingertips, I could change someone's prognosis for how long they might actually be on the treatment part of the journey by two, three, four, five times if I haven't uh, put them on the correct path. And so this is the hard part is, is you don't appreciate that as a patient, right? You, you All you know is, is you want to get out of this hell <laughs> of not knowing what's going on, not being able to grab onto a plan and, and you want to get the diagnostic process complete and meet that person who's going to give you a plan. And, and sometimes it doesn't even matter what the plan is. The plan could be for no treatment at all, Mm -hmm. but at least then you've got the information to understand um, where where the next part of the journey is. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, once you get through that very difficult part of the diagnostic journey, then then it's it's on to how are we going to approach this? Um, And there are multiple pillars of cancer treatment um, from surgery to radiation to what I do, which is what I call systemic therapy. It's things that try to get into your bloodstream to be able to fight the cancer on your behalf. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's symptom management and palliative care, um, not appropriate for every cancer patient, obviously. There are many patients who we will successfully cure them of this disease. Um, but just because, uh, you know, I think symptom management is a very important part of what we do. And, um, you know, is another space where we've come a long way, right? There, there used to be a heck of a lot more symptoms that came along with some of the different treatments we had, and we've done a lot better from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are just the easy things, right? I haven't even talked about the emotional aspects of the journey and other members of the care team that can become important from dietitians to social workers, to psychosocial oncology support, to community access supports through other people going through this journey or people who have been caregivers who have gone through this journey. Um, Lots of steps along the way. Mm -hmm. Roz, for cancer, one of the important things we tell patients to ask about is whether the illness is curable or if it's chronic, as in cannot be cured. And that's really related to the cancer stages. Can you talk about that more? It it depends on the type of cancer. Um, If we look at the typical cancers, um, one of the very first important things that we do once we've diagnosed, so let's say we know it's a breast cancer or a lung cancer, is there's a battery of tests that we will do that will um, pull together what we describe as a stage. By and large, cancers are categorized into one of four stages. So not shockingly, they're numbered one, two, three, and four. Um, Stage one are the earliest stage cancers. By and large, it's just the main tumor itself and they haven't spread into the lymph nodes or through the bloodstream. 
Stage two and stage three are a, a bit of hit and miss depending on the actual cancer. So it's a little bit more difficult, but we consider those usually either tumors that have bigger tumors and no lymph node spread or smaller tumors, but they've smartened up and they've figured out how to get in the lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. By nature of the beast, almost exclusively, but not a hundred percent, because, you know, why would cancer want to be simple? Um, mm -hmm. If the cancer has spread into the bloodstream, that's a stage four. Mm -hmm. um, now, you would think that there's, you know, value judgments isn't the right way to say it, but like, um, there, there are prognostic, you know, how, how long might someone live or what's the likelihood of cure that's attached to those different, um, stages. Mm -hmm. Um, but by no means is it, uh, hard and fast and set mm -hmm. to that regard. Mm -hmm. We now know that there's certain stage four cancers that with the right surgical and chemotherapy approach, we can cure. Um, so, um, you, you can't let your brain go, go traipsing away until you've actually had a conversation with all of the physicians in your care team mm -hmm. as to, um, a, what's that stage? And then B, what is the, the implications on, is this a curative journey? Is this mm -hmm. not a curative journey? And just because it's not a curative journey, doesn't mean it's not treatable. Okay. That is incredible. I'm so curious. How does an oncologist know if um, a cancer is curative or not? Ah, perfect. Um, so uh, to be honest, we're taking our best estimate, mm -hmm. right? Um, when we are trying to sort, we, we use stage as, as our best estimate of curability, mm -hmm. um, the struggle that we have in today's, even, even with today's technology is um, th there is nothing that comes with a hundred percent assurance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so part of what goes into stage um, is there have been literally thousands of patients of data from across this planet that have gone in to providing information around um if you're a stage one, what's the chances that you will still be alive and disease-free at five years? Mm -hmm. If you're a stage two, what's the chances that mm -hmm. you're still going to be alive at usually five years? Most people, I've got many people who've asked me about the whole five-year thing. There's mm -hmm. nothing magical about five mm -hmm. years. It's, it's literally a number in the ether that they have chosen um, because by and large, once you hit five years, the, the likelihood that that particular cancer is going to come back falls mm -hmm. off quite significantly. Mm -hmm. Still not impossible, but it's much mm -hmm. less. So it's um, based on millions and billions of people who have had that particular cancer at that stage yep. that you can, um, you know offer people if they're interested, what the um, likelihood that they will be alive in four years. Um, Correct. And so, and that helps you to understand the likelihood of whether or not it's curative or not. Yeah. And it also depends on um, like stage is not the end all be all um, because there are also certain treatments that we know carry a curative chance versus not. Mm -hmm. um, so in many circumstances, the, the best path to cure, if it's appropriate, is, is to take the cancer out, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where surgery, you know, mm -hmm. became one of the very first treatments for cancer is if you take it out of the body, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. less likely to kill you later on mm -hmm. down the road. Um, now, again, not perfect, right? The problem is, is we don't have a magical microscope that we can, you know, throw in your bloodstream and have it go hunting around looking for any rogue cancer cells they're sitting mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the where that second part of the journey is, is someone will get a, a treatment that we tell them, this is in an effort to try to cure you. Mm -hmm. You finish that treatment journey. And for some people at that treatment journey is short, where it might be just a surgical procedure or sometimes radiation can be curative. Mm -hmm. There are certain cancers where it's actually got fewer long lasting side effects to treat it with x-ray beams as opposed mm -hmm. to scalpels. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's the waiting game, right? We, we continue to either do physical exams or certain cancers where doing things like CAT scans or the like mm -hmm. don't actually help, uh, help sort things. So for example, for breast cancer, they do, they do breast exams and mammograms, and there's really no role after um, someone has had a definitive treatment for breast cancer mm -hmm. to do fancy things like CAT scans. So you talked about 
the amazing advances in treatment. And I know immunotherapy is something near and dear to your heart. And with a lot of these treatments, and if it's incurable, there's lots of treatments that can, you know, and people can get second line, third line with really great benefits and new things coming down the pipeline. I guess it, what I'm trying to ask is how, what does that look like for patients and families to know what the storyline is beyond the, you know, the next line of treatment? Like what should they be looking for to know they're transitioning from the middle stage to this late yeah. and end of life stage. And what does that mean for their life? Like, what are they, what are the signs that they should be looking for? And is there just always more treatment or is yeah. there, are there other things that can happen? So again, these are, these are conversations that evolve. Um, and the longer I have known a patient, the better I get at being able to refine what I can tell them. So when I'm first meeting somebody, it, it's like having a, a snapshot. It's almost like, you know, going on a dating profile and I, and I get to see somebody's profile, but I have no other information, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get the, the, the one picture of somebody's CAT scan and, and what their blood work and sort of that gives me a sense of how their body is functioning. I get a snapshot look at what things have happened to them in the past. So what their life's journey of medical issues has been. Um, and I take all of that information, plus the information we just got from that biopsy and from the staging, and I give them my best rough estimate of this is something I think we can try to cure. This is something I think we can try to buy time or improve symptoms. And that starts that, that journey. Okay. Mm -hmm. But as I get more information, I can refine that prognosis in some ways. So for example, one of the treatments that Sienna has mentioned that I use is something called immunotherapy. And there's multiple types of immunotherapy. I, I use the most common type of immunotherapy um, that basically engages with a patient's own immune system to be able to fight the cancer on the patient's behalf. And it works really well in, in diagnoses like melanoma, works pretty decently in things like lung cancer, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, and then it really needs a leg up to work in some other cancers like breast cancer or stomach cancer, uh, where you need chemotherapy or something else combined with it to help uh, help it do its thing. Um, so for some lucky patients, you know, they complete a journey of a course of treatment for two years, and and that's a, a different step. They're like, well, but I've been seeing you every three weeks for two years, Doctor Jurgens. What do you mean I don't need to come back for three months? This is not. I just let's just keep seeing each other every three weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, that's one aspect of the journey. Um, for other folks, you know, we may be stopping because we're starting to accumulate side effects from the treatment. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's a, it's a tricky spot. And if I'm stopping treatment because we're starting to see more side effects, how good, bad, or ugly that decision is also help the CAT scan helps us, right? Mm -hmm. If the cancer has shrunk very nicely with the treatment and it seems to have now sort of hit a plateau and we're wanting to do a break, then, then that's actually a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, if on the flip side, the cancer is growing on the CAT scan, um, then that's really a huge point of decision-making mm -hmm. because now I'm having to look and see, is there another treatment option, right? They're not, oh, there's not always going to be a second, third, fourth, fifth, eighth thing to do. Um, and if there is a next option for treatment, um, based on what that patient has experienced in this previous part of the journey, mm -hmm. um, is that treatment going to be tolerable um, or safe or the like, right? And we use, again, multiple factors to try to sort that through. Sorry, I think that's a good place to interrupt. Like, what are the tools you use to know if someone should pursue the next option, like a new line of treatment? One of the, the tools, um, if you can call it a tool, I guess that the oncologists use um, is something called an assessment of performance status. Mm -hmm. And so we'll usually come at it very subtly, right? Trying to get a sense of what's your day-to-day -day look like, right? What time do you get up? Do you get your own breakfast or does somebody get your breakfast for you? You know, are you getting yourself up and ready and, and bathed or showered? Or do you need help with that? Mm -hmm. um, are you able to get yourself dressed or not? Um, how much of the housework are you able to do? Um, 
Now, want to do is another thing, and I, I can sign up for not wanting to do housework, but are, mm-hmm. would you be able to do if if push came to shove? Are you able to walk to your mailbox? Are you able to, to tootle around the grocery store? Um, or is that something that you're no longer able to do? And we'll sometimes subtly pepper these little questions in as we talk to you about how's things been since the last time. And mm-hmm. it's us sneakily trying to get a sense of how is your body tolerating? Because, you know, what we don't want to have happen is, is I give you a treatment so that it potentially buys you some time, but that time equates to you get in the car, you come to see me after that two hour chunk of your day, you go home and you don't leave your bed couch or whatever until the next day or the day Mm -hmm. after, right? Like just Mm -hmm. the whole sense of leaving the house has sapped every drop of energy that you had. And all of a Mm -hmm. sudden you're back in the bed. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not a good sign for us. Mm-hmm. And, and, and your doctor wants to know that. Um, I tell folks that there, there is no uh, award for doctor, I call them doctor pleasers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I cannot help you if you don't engage me and tell me what's going on. One of my favorite analogies is, as I say, you know, my job as being someone who gives treatments that get into the bloodstream is it's like, I'm like a chef, but I never get to taste my own soup right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a recipe and I'm going to pull in all the different ingredients that I think are the right ingredients for your cancer type. I'm going to give you my soup and then we're going to see what happens. And there's two components to what happens. One component is, is what does that soup do against the cancer? But the second component is, is what does that soup do to the person, right? Mm -hmm. And some people may say, oh my gosh, this is the best recipe ever. I'm coming to this restaurant every two weeks. And then there are other people who say, oh my God, Dr. Jurgens, like, could you lay off the salt or I really don't like cilantro or whatever it is that like <laughs> sets them off. But if you don't tell me, I'm going to keep making the soup the same old way that I made the soup the last time and the time before and the time before that. So it's really important to communicate issues that you've had because I can't otherwise fix the soup. Erin, yeah. what, you've been listening to the conversation. Yeah. You have some questions for Roz? So Roz, I, I have discovered in my career as a family physician that um, some patients are really difficult to hold on to when they are, as I say, caught up in the cancer vortex. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I tell them there are, I have to sell myself. I say, there are three things I can help you with. I can help you fill any gaps in your knowledge about what's going on. I can help you with your symptoms and I can help you plan for the future. One of the dilemmas that patients often come to me with is, do I do this second, third, fourth, fifth line of chemotherapy? They really, really struggle with that. What have been your observations around, you know, those people that I find they fall into a couple of categories. They're willing to do anything, you know, it seems that way. And then there are people who are like, just so clear that like, no, it's not for me. Right. What have your observations been around that? Yeah. You know, everybody's a little bit different. And the hard part about second, third, fourth line treatment, wherever you may be, is whether you like it or not, you could be having all sorts of symptoms of your cancer progressing. But until the words come out of my mouth, this cancer is growing. We need a new plan. Your brain has not acknowledged it in, in the, uh, you know, the, the super, well, the, the, the part of your brain that's, that's, that's here and now, right? Like it's itching in the back of your brain and it's a reality you don't want to acknowledge, even though you, you have symptoms that make you think that it's coming back until I say those words, this cancer is growing. We need a new plan. It, it's like uh, I've, I've literally ripped the rug out from under most folks, right? And so all of a sudden you go into a visit that in theory may have been a visit to just talk about the next treatment that like the next dose of treatment that you're going to get. And you're forced with the, whoa, um, okay, this can't be good. The doctor doesn't look happy. Um And we then rush into the, okay, here are your options and your options are, and and again, everybody's so different about the way that this goes down, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, your options are, you know, second treatment X, 
an, a, a second treatment, why? Um, or potentially, unfortunately, the way that patients hear it, and it's not always, I don't think the way we say it, um, but what they hear is, or we do nothing, right? Mm -hmm. It's never, and we do nothing. It's we don't do something that's going to slow the trajectory of the cancer down. Doesn't mean we're not going to manage symptoms. We're still doing things to help improve your quality of life. We're just focusing on treating the symptoms rather than as, as a means to an end in and of itself, as opposed to treating the cancer to try to reduce the symptoms so that we don't, you know, it's, it's a, more direct path as opposed to a circular one. Yeah, you know, when I get notes from, and I would say majority of the oncology notes I get, a lot of that really helpful information is missing. Oh, right? that's not good. Yeah, and and I don't, I don't have a lot of um, information to fill in in regards to exactly what you said. Like you clearly get this. What exactly is this multi-line chemotherapy going to potentially buy me? Yep. Those are the things that the people don't have the answers to that come into my office. And so when I'm trying to have a goals of care conversation, um, you know, what's important to you? What are you hoping to gain? You know, what would you be willing to go through for X amount more time? Yeah. Right. That's, that's such crucial information I find. And so I wonder if, um, if, if we could find ways to, you know, to work better together in that regard as, as two specialties. What I personally have started doing, um, for better, or for worse, so many of my patients, um, you know, it, a good 50% of them are, are not going to take their very first step of their cancer treatment journey in a curative path. So over half of my patients are starting their journey on a palliative path. So I try very hard to make that point clear. So at least, you know, Am I going down a curative path or a palliative path? Um, Cause that's step one. And then I, I do open the door and for better, or for worse, sometimes opening the door with the questions that I will ask somebody, I will bet you dimes to dollars, grounds them in the seriousness of what we're talking about. Right. Cause again, you know, we get to talking about how this drug works and what it's going to do. And, you know, we'll give them these numbers that are not grounded in a reality that normal people think of, right? We, we, we get information about clinical trials on what the 50th person out of a hundred might get from how long it takes for their cancer to grow on this treatment. Or if you're really lucky, you find out like, what's the 50th person out of a hundred, that average person, how long are they going to live with this mm -hmm. treatment as our choice? Mm -hmm. Um, but that's still a really hard thing. You know, like, how do I put myself in a lineup of hundred people? And then she's talking about the 50th one, but where am I? Am I number one? Am I number a hundred? Like, mm -hmm. where am I on this line? And, you know, people don't envision some of the statistics that oncologists give them. Um, and, and we probably don't do as good of a job at, at describing it well. Um, but I open up with simple things. I, I wait until I, you know, I, I talk about the diagnosis. I talk about the treatments. I talk about what the intent of the treatment is. And then before I let them go, I say, this is, this is how I spiel. So mm -hmm. can I ask you some really difficult questions? And for some people, they're not difficult at all, but you know, I broach it as it's a difficult set of questions. Um, I said, first question, do you have a will? Well, as soon as somebody asks you if you have a will, you wonder why might I need, might need a will. And I think that that's sort of a moment, uh, the lightning moment of, oh, I only need a will if I'm not going to be on this planet forever. So she must know something about something. So mm -hmm. I, I get the answer. Do I have a will? And then I usually ask, have you looked at it recently? And are you happy with it? Because this is probably the time to look at it. Um, second thing I ask is, is have you ever talked with your family, or do you have any known wishes that you would like me to know about, right? Have you ever thought about if you were faced with something of a, a large magnitude with your health, you know, what, how, how far you would want to go, right? And so, you know, I do tell patients, you know, it, it's not easy, but, um, you know, if you find me chatting with you about, you know, what did you do since last I saw? And I get to hear about children, grandchildren, spouses, anniversaries, birthdays. Um, I do try to tell them that like, it, I can't do my job to the best of my ability unless I not only know your cancer, but I know you. 
Um, because until I know both of those things, I can't craft a, a treatment plan of any sort um, to the best of my ability to personalize things. Because it's not about personal, it's not just about personalizing someone's treatment plan based on cancer information. It's about personalizing someone's treatment journey based on the combination of what I know from a biology and a molecular genetics perspective, as well as what I know from a patient. Yeah, so that's another way you can customize your order, like using your specific biological or molecular genetic profile. Um, that's another example um, of making sure the care is personalized to you. You know, I, I think back to one of the, the patients very early in my career, um, and it was back in the early days when we first discovered these, what we call molecular drivers of lung cancer and lung cancer has come a heck of a long way. And so now I do upwards of a dozen tests. And if I find one of these tests comes up positive, many of these patients have tablet treatments they can take. And they, they that's a something that, that, that really aligns with, with what money patients want to get out of their journey. Um, and so there was this one lady and I just adored her. She was 80 and taught dancing to seniors, like, ding, 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 such an amazing like woman. Um, and I found one of these mutations and I was super stoked. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is such and such. You've got one of these mutations. I have tablet treatment. And this was when it was the very first tablet we ever had for these types of things. I gave her a prescription, super stoked. Again, high response rate. She comes in two weeks later, brings me the box, throws it on my desk. She was like, you can keep your tablets. <laughs> she got a skin rash from it, which is one of the typical side effects. So her face got flushed and she got a rash and she was like, I will die tomorrow before I am showing up to my dance class or my bridge club or whatever it was with a face that looks like that. So like she knew herself, right? She knew that she didn't care if she could have gotten three years instead of six months. Mm -hmm three years with a skin rash was not part of her life plan. Mm -hmm. Good for her, right? Good mm -hmm. for her. You know, as somebody who's clearly so strong and well-versed in her profession and, mm -hmm. you know, you're doing such great work with patients. I'm very curious, you know, what it is that you yourself, what do you struggle with the most? What's the hardest for you? Because this podcast is, is meant for patients and families, caregivers, um, but what would maybe patients and caregivers be surprised about that oncology struggles with in those encounters? Yeah, well, the hardest part for us is, is never feeling like what we do is enough, right? And it's funny, like there are patients that I will, I will do my thing for and I'll pull out all the stops to get the treatment going. Do you know who I get the most thank yous from though? It's the patients where I tell them, I don't think it's the right thing for them to do to actually take treatment at all. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget in just this last year, I had a, a husband and wife come into my clinic um, and he was young. He was young and every fiber of my being wanted to find a treatment that I could give this guy because that's what I do, right? I try to fix things, right? Mm -hmm. I looked at his blood work. I looked at his CAT scans and I'm like, I cannot, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I I, it's not, I cannot, I could have, right. I could have written something. It would have been easier. It would have been easier for me to have written a prescription for a chemotherapy and let him suck it up. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have treated him and I didn't treat him. Um, and after a very long day that day, the patient, he was hospitalized and he and his wife went back to the room and they had been waiting for what felt like again, probably weeks to come to the culmination of this visit with me, where I said, here's what your prognosis is. I think you've got weeks that might end up being a couple of months of time. And I don't think we should offer you treatment because I actually think that will take those weeks that might end up being a couple of months and make it days that might end up being a couple of weeks. I actually think I'm going to harm you. And that's not what I've signed up for. Um, so I don't think it's the right thing to do. And so as I was finally leaving that day at like 7.30 at night or whatever time it was, um, she happened to be leaving uh, to go home and, and, and get herself some food, et cetera. And she caught me at the corner as we were both walking into the parking garage um, and she hugged me and she said, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for being honest with us. Thank you for not doing what was easy. She's like, that had to have been like, I, like I, it's not very often that I have a patient have the moment of reflection in that awful time who said that had to have been really hard for you. This is why I'm so grateful that, that Sammy and CN have done this podcast 
because I think, you know, targeting patients and families to give them the tools and the language to approach people like you in this just crazy, not enough time system is absolutely the right place to go. So we really are trying to encourage people to not just get information, but to really seek the meaning of the information in the context of where they're at in their illness journey. So for example, my CAT scan looks um, worse today, but what does that mean in terms of where I'm at? Am I at first line early chapter? Is my CAT scan looking worse, but Roz is going to tell me I'm in the middle of my cancer. So we're we're trying to get people anchored in the big picture uh, when they're, when they're getting information. Being able to see the forest through the trees. Exactly. We're trying to have people look and you've described the forest beautifully um, and the trees, but it's like this toggling back and forth, right? Um, People have to hear the trees of it, but then they have to get the oncologist to help them understand the forest of it. Um, And what's the long view? How are things going to unfold? So uh, I think we got a ton of information from you, a ton. I think one of the things that is hard for patients and families when we talk about the long view and the tipping point is how to differentiate when they're just feeling not so great because of side effects of the treatment or the toxicity, we would call it, versus when they've actually reached, quote unquote, the tipping point and they're moving to the later stage of their illness. So how do they know when that transition is happening? I think it, it depends on where you're at in your journey, right? Yeah. And that's the the very difficult part about the first say month or so on a new treatment is, you know, generally when you've started a treatment line, um, you know, the, the cancers uh, in, in many ways, it's a drain on the system. Right. Mm-hmm. So the cancer is taking it's like a bad dictator. It's going to take its calories. It's going to take its pittance first. Mm-hmm. Um, and then whatever's left, the patient gets. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden I add something on top where I'm putting a second drain on the system, the mm-hmm. chemotherapy. Right. And the hope is, is that we hit a steady state where the chemotherapy has hit the cancer hard enough that the cancer stops draining the battery. So now you still have the drain on the the system of the chemotherapy, but the cancer is not taking nearly as much of the piece of the pie any longer. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where all of a sudden you see, you know, symptoms start to improve is as if in, in, in the grand balance of things, if the chemotherapy is pulling less charge off the battery than the cancer ever was, mm-hmm. um, then you start to see patients feel better. Mm-hmm. Um, where it gets a little bit harder is, you know, like you can literally think about this, like people think about their iPhone batteries, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, when you get a brand new fancy phone, right? Wow. It's like the battery charge lasts forever. Right. And so you can mm-hmm. play with your phone all day long and you still have some charge left at the end mm-hmm. of the day. Um, but when your phone is a year old or two years old or three years old, all of a sudden, when you have something pulling heavily on the system, it, it doesn't last the day anymore. Right. And so you, now you have to find an opportunity to charge. Um, and you know, that might come after 12 hours now where you could make it 18 hours before, Mm -hmm. um, you get into the third year of that battery life. And all of a sudden now, like if I'm really using social media or whatever, like my Mm -hmm. battery life lasts now six hours. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's just because you, you, you're pulling from a, a, a different piece of the pie. Right. Um, so it sounds when you've got like a healthy, healthy, when you've got a healthy human, yeah. you can, you can take and take and take. And as soon as you let it rest, it gets back to almost a hundred percent. But as you move from first line to second line that we may, the, the, the best may not be a hundred percent anymore, but let's say the best is 80%. I can only get myself back up to like 80% of what good me was. Um, and then I drain the battery and then I come back up and it may be 80, 40, 50. And let's say, Second, third line, you're now sitting at 50% of the battery. The, the you, You've got less capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you pull the battery, you know, all of a sudden you start to tease with rock bottom where your phone's going to die, right? Mm-hmm. Where you 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 sleep, you must rest, or you can't, can't pass go, can't collect $200. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's a little bit of an, al- an analogy of, of mm-hmm. what someone is, is like as they go through their cancer journey. You start with a fresh battery, and eventually, you know, you're, you're no longer able to charge it all the way up to hundred percent. 
I, I love that analogy because what I'm hearing from you is that trends are really important. So stepping back and really looking at how is my battery running out over time, not just a day, not just the day after chemo or the first week after treatment. It's really stepping back and trying to look at the trend of the battery Um, and knowing that after different treatments, you might not feel well for a while. That's not a huge alarm saying, "Uh oh, the tipping point has come. It's about stepping back and seeing how much do you recover after that trough? And what did your battery start off at at the beginning? So there's multiple things that play into a person's sense or an oncologist's sense of where you're at in the illness journey. And those are important things to communicate back, right? When I start to hear a patient say, I used to get 10 good days between treatments, and then it was only seven good days between treatments. And now it's like 48 hours before I come back to you where I'm finally feeling better or I'm having good days. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a sign to me that I'm, I'm pulling too much juice from the battery and we may have to look at how do we mitigate that, right? Yeah, so I was just gonna follow up because it connects with what you're saying, this idea of, of draining the battery and the desire to be hopeful, including patients and families who have that pressure. So if they came to you and said, I wanna hope for the best, but plan for the rest. Yep. What does the plan for the rest look like in the context of, you know, they're in third line chemotherapy because, you know, we have tricks up their sleeve, there's clinical yep. trials, there's always something. So, and maybe I'm okay, you know, I, I've readjusted my, my, my expectations that I could still be at 50% and my life could be good. Yep. So what does that conversation look like of what they should be? They can still hope there's, there's lots of things to hope for, but what should they be planning for when they're later in their stage? I'm going to say they're, you know, they're transitioning from late to end of life, not the last weeks, yep. but they're definitely in their final chapter. We're starting to run out of options, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, this is where I think, again, having that opportunity of having a sense of people's priorities is helpful. And that's where those serious illness conversations are extremely helpful is, is that those conversations are, they're scripted and they're meant to be done in a fashion such that, um, you know, I ask questions in a way that I wouldn't otherwise necessarily ask them. Um, so it, you know, when, when does somebody come into my clinic and I say, you know, Sian, what are you scared of? What, what keeps you up at night that, uh, that you're, you know, just really the, the, the earwig in your brain about what's making you, what makes you worried? Is there anything that you're scared of? Um, and then, you know, what things are you hopeful for, right? Are there things that you're trying to achieve? Um, you know, are there, are there things in your life that, um, that bring you joy or you're looking forward to, um, because those things are important as well. And sort of resetting the, the thermostat around, um, okay, you know, now that I know that, you know, you're, you're, you're scared of, you know, being alone, you're scared of, um, scared of being short of breath, you're scared of pain that we might not be able to control like that, you know, so then I can be like, okay, so now that I know that this is an issue for you, you know, now when I listen, I'm going to hear, and I'm going to note, okay, this person's describing pain. Um, we're going to bump that up on our priority list of these are the things that we absolutely cannot leave the room without addressing today. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Because again, things that are on, on, on my priority list may not be on the patient's priority list. Um, And so it, like I said, some of those conversations can help to, to reorient the task list of the day. Um, You know, silly things like, you know, I, I really want to be able to go to my grandkids. He's, playing in a baseball tournament and the treatment gives me diarrhea and I'm too scared to go and watch them play because I don't know where I'm going to find a washroom. Right. Well, okay. You know what? We're going to hold a dose of this treatment so that you don't have the diarrhea with this round. And I'm going to let you have that, that thing it both, I'm going to give that gift to you and to your grandchild so that they get to remember that moment when grandma or grandpa or whoever it was, or mom or dad got to be there for the entire baseball tournament. And, uh, you, you know, they, they get those memories that, you know, you're never going to have another chance to make again. Right. Um, 
So I think it's important to talk about those things. And again, like I said, you know, you may think, oh God, Dr. Jurgens is two hours late. And now she's sitting here asking me about how did I tolerate the, the windstorm or what did I do with, you know, like mm-hmm. there's reasons we make those little bits of conversation and it's, it's so that we can get to know someone. And that's a subtle way for us to, to get a sense of priority and mm-hmm. how somebody's doing. Like I said, we're sneaky little creatures. Like we get information mm-hmm. out of you in all sorts of different ways. Um, but that's, that's, that's how we do our job best. Uh, as a palliative care physician, of course, and you probably get this too. A lot of people assume that a measurement of where they're at in their illness or how quickly things are changing is the amount of pain they're having. And I spend a lot of time demystifying um, that issue. Uh, There are lots of people who have cancer, who go through the cancer journey, who never experience pain. And there are some, as you know, that do have pain. It's often not a measurement of where you're at in your illness journey. Uh, One of the other symptoms, though, that tends to be a little bit of a measurement is appetite. Um, So appetite can come and go early, middle of the illness journey. But when it goes and it stays away, no matter what anyone's doing, a person really loses their appetite. uh, And it's a trend over time. That can be a uh, harbinger for the, my system isn't holding up a, yeah. as well as it used to. Fatigue also can come and go. But when we're looking for trends of symptoms for patients yeah. to understand, I say, okay, pain's not one of them, yeah. but losing stamina and energy and losing your appetite yeah. and yeah. being more tired yeah. and yeah. feeling weaker. These are some of the signs when it's not just related to a treatment yeah. um, that, that, that your body is trying to tell us that it is getting tired. And we do ask patients that again, I I, I think they don't appreciate why we make them do that. We make them do these little surveys when they come into the cancer center, they're called symptom assessments. Mm -hmm. Um, And in some ways it is about how you're doing the the questions are, how are you feeling today? Right. Mm -hmm. And there's eight Mm -hmm. different domains of, of how you're feeling today. Um, And that may not capture anything about how how you're truly doing. Um, But it does pick up on a lot of those key things that you're talking about. And and patients actually rate themselves on how they feel like they're functioning is one of the last questions on that list. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and, and one snapshot in time doesn't tell Mm -hmm. the whole tale, Mm -hmm. but we actually can graph it over time and get to Mm -hmm. see hey, wait a minute, slowly but surely, you know, this person's, you know, anxiety is increasing or this person's Mm -hmm. depression is increasing or this person's, you know, appetite is worsening. Mm -hmm. And it gives me an opportunity then to step back and say, hey, it's kind of like uh, watching your own kids grow, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in Mm -hmm. in day to day, you don't notice that they're changing Mm -hmm. until you step back and you look at a photo of them three months or, you know, it's like, you know, my parents didn't get to see my children for two whole years in the pandemic and the flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, Oh my God, I really didn't appreciate how much taller they got or whatever. <laughs> and it's the same thing with us grabbing those symptoms. Mm-hmm. One day doesn't tell the tale, but mm-hmm. when I get a sense to step back and say, Hey, wait a minute, mm-hmm. you know, there there's been this slow accumulation of symptoms that you're not necessarily appreciating in that very little moment. Mm-hmm. But when I look at it and as a bigger picture, you know, step back and look mm-hmm. for that forest, as opposed to looking at the individual tree, mm-hmm. it can help us to, to, to recognize that, Hey, you know, maybe it's time for us to start bringing in some more people into our circle. Right. And mm-hmm. whether that's a dietitian, because, you know, appetite's off, but it's because nothing tastes right. And so appetite may be part and parcel of something that I could fix. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, or it might be that, um, you know, again, uh, uh, pain or, you know, f- fatigue mm-hmm. Every once in a while, I, I forget that, um, you know, our, our pain and symptom management, our palliative care experts, they're experts for a reason. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm good at my job, but they're great at their job. Um, and so sometimes having a fresh set of eyes mm-hmm. can really bring in enlightenment. Thanks for joining us today, both Roz and Aaron. Thank you both. I am so grateful and I thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the invite, guys. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. You can visit our website, 
waitingroomrevolution.com to learn more about our movement and how you can join it. The podcast is produced by myself, Kayla McMillan, Valerie Bishop, Shilpa Jyothi Kumar, and Maggie Sivak. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketza.